Merry Christmas. Let's go to the Word. Go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the rich reminder of just what you came to do through the work of your Son. Lord, we thank you that through him we saw your light. Lord, be with us as we are in your word this morning. May you illuminate us as we look at it. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. This time of year, we all love to look at Christmas lights. They're bright and colorful and usually put a smile on our face. Our family, when time allows, will travel through neighborhoods looking for these displays, these special displays. <clears throat> and we have even gone to places that set up trails of lights, especially for the season, for the Christmas season. For many, doing this is a family tradition. The, lights, the light displays that are the most exciting to see are the ones that express the true meaning of Christmas and why we celebrate this season. They point to the babe in the manger and the joy of his coming to save mankind from their sins and ultimately show us the need for a savior. Naturally, the best time to see these lights is at night. They shine brighter because the darkness surrounds them. Because light has its greatest effect when it is the darkest. All mankind had been plunged into darkness the moment that Adam sinned in the garden. Romans 5.12 states that through that one act of disobedience, all men became sinners. Because like Adam, we all sin, which results in death. God then shows a people to bring hope to the nations. His, his goal was to reveal himself to the world through the nation Israel. But God's chosen people failed to obey his laws and commandments. And as a result, they entered into a prolonged period of darkness as we come to the end of the Old Testament period, Old Testament canon. To understand the darkness more fully, we will look at two events that demonstrate just how dark things were for God's people. First, the first event is a vision that Ezekiel had vividly showing the glory of God departing from the temple in Jerusalem. So turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 10. Ezekiel chapter 10, we'll be looking at verses 18 and 19, and then we'll be popping to 11 as well to see the end of the vision. Verse 18, then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. While the cherubim departed, they lifted their wings and rose up from the earth in my sight with the wheels beside them. And they stood still at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of, God, of the God of Israel hovered over them. And we see the end of the vision now as we bump down to chapter 11, verse 23. So if you'd move to 1123, it says this, Then the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood over the mountain, which is east of the city. God's glory moving away from Israel. <clears throat> Ezekiel sees a vision of the glory of the Lord leaving the temple. And what is the meaning of this vision? Israel was called out to be a witness for God. That was their mission. That was what God had intended them to be, to draw other nations to him. By obedience to him, God's people were to make him known and to draw other nations to worship Yahweh also. 
but they had failed miserably at this mission. Instead of showing devotion to Yahweh, they worshiped foreign gods and did abominable acts, even sacrificing their own children to these foreign gods. In Ezekiel's vision, the glory of the Lord leaves the temple and the nation because of this disobedience of Israel first and then Judah. The temple is destroyed in Babylon's final incursion into Judah. And we, see the, we see that destruction. And that meant ex- exile for the final and the final deportation of the people uh, from Judah and Jerusalem. And we see then this is the fulfillment of Ezekiel's vision. And even though they did, they did return to Jerusalem, we know that they went back, they rebuilt the temple, they rebuilt the, the walls in the city, and they did that under Ezra and under Nehemiah. They remained a vassal state, ruled by another country, and they had no independence of their own. They were not free as they were before. They're still in this period of darkness. And God's glory did not return with them when they came back. The second event we see, we also get a greater sense of the darkness because of the 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And this here is our second event. So we see the glory of, the God, of, of God leaving the temple, leaving Jerusalem, the people of Israel. And now we see this 400 years of silence. By God's sovereign hand, the Jews were back in the land. But after returning from exile, they went right back into the same sins as they had before. And here's a quote from, from one of the commentators. And less than 100 years since returning from captivity they had already sunk to a depth of sin greater than the sin that, that had brought God's judgment on them, sending them into exile. Malachi was the last prophet to prophesy uh, to God's chosen people before this 400 years of silence. It, it, is, in, it is amazing to see what Malachi testifies of, of this people, of God's people. He reveals a corrupt priesthood and a heart of a people going through the motions in worship, in worshiping Yahweh. He had a message of condemnation for the sin that was so prevalent and a warning to God that God was calling them to heed. Judgment was coming to those who would refuse to fear the Lord. At the end of the Old Testament, for the majority of the country, there was no real love or true devotion for Yahweh. After Malachi stopped speaking to them through, after Malachi, God stopped speaking to them through the prophets. They had 400 years of silence with no direction from God. The only thing left ringing in their ears is Malachi's indictment of who they are and what they have done in their relationship to their God. This truly is a dark time for the Jewish people. But God, God does not leave them and he does does not leave us hopeless He sent messengers to testify about a light that would break through the darkness. Isaiah is our first witness. Over a hundred years before Ezekiel's vision, God speaks through the prophet Isaiah of a light that in the future will shine out of darkness. So let's go to our main text this morning, Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9. Very familiar passage. Most of us, 
We've sang about this even this morning, this passage. Um, <clears throat> and it truly is remarkable, God giving us hope, even before all this, this vision of his glory leaving them and leaving the temple. A hundred years earlier, he gives us this hope. Verse 1, But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by way of the sea. On the other side of Jordan, Galilee of, of the Gentiles. And here's our verse. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Isaiah prophesies here of a future hope for people walking in darkness. And that is everyone at that time. He proclaims that in the future, God will send a light to all people. Not just to the nation of Israel, but to all people. Not only to the Jews, but all men. Just a few verses down, Isaiah tells us about the source of that light. A child will be born. That's the child that we've sang about all morning. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. One who will reign with justice and righteousness. And he will be a light to break through the darkness. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, one of the righteous remnant, confirms this in Luke. You can turn with me to Luke 1. We're going to bounce around a lot. There's a few passages we're going to hit as we go through this today. Looking at four witnesses. Zechariah, the father of John, uh, we see this in Luke 1, starting with verse 76. Our second witness is Zechariah. He testifies of the light Isaiah mentioned all those years ago, and is now, it's drawing near. Zechariah, uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 76. And you, child, and this is this is. Zechariah speaking about John, speaking to John. Will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our, fate, our feet into the way of peace. You see, the light breaks through the darkness, and it is on the verge. Zechariah is telling us that. Zechariah recognizes that this coming one will illuminate truly what salvation and forgiveness really look like. John set the table. John came and, and laid out repentance that, that the nation of Israel needed to repent in order to come back to God, in order to right their relationship. But it was Christ who would illuminate truly what forgiveness and repentance is all about. See, they had been in the dark about what it means. Ultimately, forgiveness does not come through repeated animal sacrifices. Salvation and forgiveness comes through faith in one man who is the perfect sacrifice. But the time is now here for the child foretold by Isaiah to appear, the light breaking through the darkness. We see this in the account of the angels announcing the birth of the Messiah, Jesus they are the next witnesses. Turn with me now to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, please. I'm getting your sword drill fingers in there. Let's go. Luke chapter 2, uh, verse, starting with verse 8. Verse 8. 
We sang about this in Hark the Herald Angels Sing. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all people. For today in the city of David there has born has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Emmanuel, God with us. This will be a sign to you, for you will find a babe wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Imagine, imagine being out, being a shepherd out in the fields. And again, as we picture this idea of what darkness is, think about their, their time, what would have been going on. Um, it may be hard for us city folk to relate to this because we're so close to the city. City lights at night always obscure how dark it gets at night and makes it hard for us to understand this concept fully. But if you've ever been out to farther northern uh, Wisconsin, maybe in the boundary, or um, northern Minnesota, in the Boundary Waters area, where there is nothing around, you can maybe get a glimpse of what this darkness was, was all about. Um, as we said, no, no city lights whatsoever to speak of. Maybe a campfire for these men was all that they had. Um, and possibly there was just stars in the sky. Uh, again, very dark, very, uh, very dark at this point in time. Um, depending upon the cycle of the moon, they may not even have had moonlight that night. The point is, it was very dark. It was very dark. Then an angel and a multitude of the heavenly hosts appear. Now think Think about that. Imagine the brilliance of that many angels appearing in the night sky to these men who are used to working in the dark at night with their sheep, focused on their job, and boom, this appears before them. A multitude, some commentators suggested it was possibly 10,000 angels. Now, most of us don't think that when we think of angels appearing and singing to the shepherds. We think of a, a lot lesser number, maybe some big core uh, choirs that we've known or seen in the past. But a you know, multitude uh, is talked about in Revelations as well. And it's multitudes upon multitudes and, and, and thousands upon thousands, it says in Revelations. But here we're talking about a multitude, 10,000 angels appearing. It was understandable why the shepherds were terrified, right? But here's what they're announcing. God's glory is returning, is returning to his people, to tabernacle with them once again. The babe in the manger. God in human flesh. He is making himself known. He is there now again with them. This long-awaited child of the promise in Isaiah is here, all perfectly worked out by God's sovereign will. The light has broken through the darkness. Simeon confirms this when Jesus is presented at the temple, and he is the fourth to testify of the light. A couple pages, just maybe a little bit further down the page, uh, Luke 2, verse 30. Simeon says this, For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all the peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. 
Simeon testifies that Jesus is the light that Isaiah prophesied about. Jesus is the light of revelation to all people. We see this confirmed. We see this confirmed in John 1. The beloved disciple speaks of the light. John here confirms what Simeon states in Luke. John 1, 4. This passage, our pastor broke down for us last year uh, in an amazing way. And he gives testimony here in John 4 of, of that light. In him, Christ, in him, meaning Christ, was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. His people were not, did not understand that Jesus was the Messiah. They didn't grasp that concept. When we look at the rejection of the leaders of Israel, it was clear they did not see him as their Messiah. And ultimately, they did reject him. But many would be drawn to the light through Christ's life and ministry. John tells us how this light was revealed in verse 14 of that same chapter 1. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The child born in Bethlehem is the Messiah the God-man. God's glory comes back to men in the person of Jesus Christ. The salvation of all mankind, only he could accomplish this for us. We see this. We see the light. We see the light that is coming from Christ. We see the confirmation of those witnesses that have told us and confirmed that Jesus is, this babe is the light that Isaiah spoke about. So what is our response? What is our response to seeing these great truths? Bottom line, we need to receive him. We need to receive Jesus Christ. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, To them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. We must believe in the work of this one named Jesus. We must have faith that his righteousness will cover our sin. That this baby would one day go go on to, to be put on a cross and pay the penalty for our sin and to make us a child of God. Jesus declares this about himself in John 8, 12. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, All men walk in darkness until they meet the precious Savior. We're drowning in our own sinfulness. And we don't even realize how sinful we truly are. But when the light is revealed to our hearts, when the light shines on us, it reveals our deep need. It reveals our lack of ability. It reveals to us that we desperately need this Savior. Jesus is still breaking through the darkness and shining on people today. And that's the message we're bringing here. This is a short and sweet message. 
but the impact of it can be for your lifetime. Christ is the light that wants to shine upon you. Perhaps you are in darkness today. Let the testimony of those who have witnessed about the light speak to you now. Jesus came for one purpose, one purpose, and that was to be the perfect sacrifice for us so that we could know the Father, so that we could be drawn to him and be children of God with an inheritance Because of being in him, we have an immense privilege. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 1. It is important for us to understand the rich blessings that are in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. What was the kind intention of his will? It was sending his son. It was sending the sacrifice for you and me. To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. In Jesus Christ, God lavished his love on us through the sacrifice, through the giving of his son that we celebrate that comes this time, that we celebrate this time of year. In wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of time. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, another promise, we also have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will. Are you getting the picture here? It is all because of our association with Christ. That babe in the manger, that light that broke through the darkness. In him, We have these things available to us. To the end that we who were first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. That's why he called us out. That's why he sent us his son. He sent us his son so that we would then bring glory and honor to his name by living for that light that shone on us, that revealed our darkness and pulled us out of darkness into that glorious light. We now have an inheritance if we are in him. But, but today, you must be in him. You must accept who Jesus Christ is, the Messiah, the one who came, to this earth to be that perfect sacrifice. He was the perfect sacrifice and paid this penalty of sin for those who would put their faith and trust in him as their Lord and Savior. Let him set you free today. Let him set you free today. Let him remove the darkness from you. Jesus said in John 12, verse 46, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. Christ's own words. If you believe in him, 
if you put your faith and trust in him, you will not remain in darkness anymore, but you will walk in the light. Ask God to shine on you today. He will break through your darkness and bring you into the light of his glorious son. We're going to wrap it up early here this morning. But think about those words. Think about what Christ has done. Think about that babe and that light that Isaiah talked about so many years, prophesied so many years before. He has broken through. He has made a way. He has brought us close to the Father. But we must believe in him. Believe in him today. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to look, Lord, at your testimony from your word about the truth that you've laid out for us, Father. You have given us a clear picture of your hope, and that hope is in Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the light that has come into the heart of, of, of so many here, Lord. I thank you for the saving work of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, For some of us, these are reminding words. These are helping us to remember what we are celebrating here today. And Lord, let us go out and, pro- and project that light. Let, us, let the glory that you have bestowed upon us through your Son now glorify and, and shine on others, Lord, so that they may know who Jesus Christ is and what he has accomplished on our behalf, on their behalf. We thank you for the saving work of Christ, Lord. The babe in the manger is just a precursor to the cross. And we thank you for his willingness to come, to humble himself, and to be what we need, Lord. He became nothing, nothing special when it comes to being a human. And that, was, that is what is so remarkable. Christ knows our every hardship and weakness because he was us. And what a joy that is for us to remember this season, Lord, that he knows all our hurts and sorrows, Lord, yet um, he has given us victory through him. We thank you for your son. We thank you for his incredible work, Lord. We thank you for this day. We pray this in your son's name, amen.